Today's webinar is about securing the modern fintech network, where we're going to start talking about applying zero trust architectures to the network and machine learning uh, to our cloud connectivity as it relates to fintech networks. My name is Lance Johnson. I am the VP of Marketing at TrustGrid, and with me today is Joe Gleinzer. He is the co-founder and chief product officer of TrustGrid. For those of you who are not familiar with TrustGrid, TrustGrid is a zero trust networking solution that combines elements of SD-WAN, edge computing, and zero trust remote user access into a single platform. So with those intros behind us, let's go ahead and get started. Given that this is a webinar about fintech networks, I thought we'd start by talking about what those typically consist of. So typical fintech network usually consists of a mix of VPN and MPLS networks. And MPLS has evolved into things like AWS Direct Connect or, or Azure Express Route. But they're all dedicated circuits that are paid for monthly, and they usually run you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars a month for a single connection. We all know what VPNs are. Um, VPNs, you know, usually have uh, deployments that have their own complexities. They are complicated by on-premise uh, equipment configurations, and MPLS has their own uh, complications. They're notorious for having to wait months and months for telecom providers to spin up a new circuit. These connections tend to require a team of certified engineers to deploy and manage. They tend to be bespoke connections that don't really add much strategic value to the organization. And while they require a ton of time and energy to manage, they've sort of become this necessary evil instead of a strategic program. And finally, these networks are both CapEx and OPEX heavy. You've got expensive equipment, you've got expensive uh, monthly payments for circuits, you get forced equipment refreshes, and you've got teams of people to, to manage these things. And all of those costs just keep going up and up. I, I think you get my point. So a few stats have emerged um, over the past year that I wanted to talk about. So the, the first is that attacks on VPNs have risen 2,000% this year. This is a, a massive spike. And this is significant because these connections are so ubiquitous. 93% of organizations use VPNs. But the good news is that three out of four IT executives say that they are prioritizing the adoption of zero trust models. So I assume that all of you know what zero trust is, but for those that don't, zero trust is based on the concept of Never trust, always verify as it relates to access. So everything on the network is micro-segmented to prevent lateral movements and all traffic and users are authenticated before access is allowed. So this stands in contrast to a traditional network security model that uses a perimeter-based security and allows every user system inside of the walls of the network to move about freely. So those are some general statistics, but you know, here we have some concrete examples of the way that, that some networks have failed. So Finastra, Finastra is a, a huge FinTech provider, $2 billion a year company. They operate in 130 countries. They've got 10,000 employees. They've got thousands of customers and those customers happen to be banks. In 2017, they were attacked. Uh, this attack was discovered when they noticed that all of their customers' data was being encrypted. It was a ransomware attack. Uh, the attack was spreading so fast that it forced Finastra to take all of its servers offline to contain the spread. And they were down for the rest of the day to remediate that. You know, given that their customers were banks and that they have thousands of these bank customers, uh, and these banks depend on Finastra services to run their entire business, you can imagine that the impact that this had uh, across the sector and to all of those banks' customers. The attack started through a VPN that was breached due to a lack of timely patching. It was a known issue and it was exploited. Had there been proper patching and updating, the breach probably wouldn't have occurred at all. But beyond that, if there was zero trust architectures in place, the blast radius of the breach would have been eliminated or limited to a specific server or a set of servers and their entire customer base wouldn't have been impacted in the way that it was. Second example. Also a ransomware example, <clears throat> this was a ransomware called Cringe, and it was being spread 
uh, throughout Europe earlier this year. And, and similar to the Finastra breach, it happened through a VPN. The brand of VPN was different, but uh, the, the result was the same. And once the malware had infected a system, it was then spreading to other systems and so on and so forth. Once again, patching, updating, zero trust would have prevented this breach and the severity of damage as it spread across the continent. These are just two small examples of network breaches. They don't encompass the wide array of, of network architectures that we find in FinTech. But if this is happening on internet facing public networks, which are usually a hundred times more secured than the point to point networks that we often find in, in FinTech, what do you think is happening to the internal private WANs and the WANs between two parties that we do find in FinTech? I mean, the answer is that those breaches don't make the news. They're usually kept quiet. And I'm sure everyone who's worked in tech for long enough has had a dinner conversation about some breach that was kept quiet because of the reputational risk it would pose for the company. So you can only imagine how uh, widespread that these network breach problems are. So why did this happen? Well, um, like we've said, I mean, it was lack of patching. These patches uh, for these network appliances are sometimes issued multiple times a month by vendors. Uh, you know, when I looked a few months back, Cisco had released a, a patch for a certain model of, of router. They had released three patches in one month. You know, and if you're managing hundreds or thousands of networks, spending even 15 minutes on an update uh, can result in a ton of time being spent to, to patch and update all of those um, network devices uh, across your entire environment. So these networks aren't getting patched as often as they need to. You've also got zero visibility because all of these networks exist in silos. Each one is built um, and maintained separately. This separation means that logging of traffic, changes to access, uh, and threat detection have to come from third-party tools and have to all be uh, manually and separately connected. And for a lot of organizations, that just uh, is a bridge too far. It doesn't happen at all. Lateral movement. Um, Perimeter-based security approaches lack the ability to notice or prevent malicious activity that is happening inside of the network. So you're sort of uh, blind to it when it does happen. And, and you know, again, the trusted model allows for um, those actors or, or, or uh, bots to freely roam. And for connections between two party organizations, we have this um, expectation of shared responsibility. This is a, a, a new level of complexity that has to be orchestrated. So there's a dance between multiple policies, multiple standards, and the communication of escalations that has to happen when two parties are involved. And with more complexity comes more chances for security gaps. The financial services industry and fintech are the number one target for cyber criminals. And this has been the number one uh, target for, for many years now. And the impact of these breaches is probably obvious to many of you, but uh, you know the, the, the direct impacts of downtime, um, missed SLAs, sometimes with financial penalties, uh, lawsuits uh, and regulatory fines, those are, those are tangible. Uh, impacts, but the indirect um, can have an even bigger impact. You've got the loss of customer trust. You've got negative press. You've got increased regulatory scrutiny and losing future deals due to the FUD that you have just handed on a silver platter to your competitors can be felt for years after, after the breach happens. So, Weighing in just behind the, the human elements in an IT environment, um, VPN and MPLS networks are also one of the, the biggest weak points in a fintech ecosystem. So first, you've got complex configurations. Um, complex configurations don't necessarily mean that things will be misconfigured, but every time you add complexity to any problem, those chances do go up. So, you know, the rule of thumb is that simplicity is always better than complexity. Patches that require frequent and, and manual intervention introduce chances for those things to be delayed or not happen at all. And this puts the network at risk of both a breach and falling out of regulatory compliance. And VPN and MPLS connections have 
very limited visibility into what's actually happening on the network. Uh, again, these networks are operating under trust and that all uh, traffic is assumed to be good, even when we know that sometimes it's not. And in that same breath, we can add that this grants lateral movement capabilities and gives the ability to hop from one system or application to another. You know, mostly uh, these problems are attributed to VPN and MPLS technology being decades old and with only model, modest uh, incremental improvements along the way. But the cloud really gives us a, a chance to think differently about things, whether that's public or private cloud. Uh, those architectures um, allow us to think differently about the way that we are connecting. So, you know, to talk a little bit more about this, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Joe. Joe? Thanks, Lance. And welcome, everyone. As Lance mentioned earlier, my name is Joe Gleinzer. I'm a co-founder here at Trustgrid. Um, and we'll start the next part of this presentation uh, with, with, you know, a pretty revolutionary idea whose time has come, the cloud in general, I think. Most uh, organizations today, safe to say, are embracing the cloud in some form or fashion. Many organizations are embracing it completely as a replacement for their data center and applications, whether that's through an IAS approach or a SaaS approach. Uh, the approaches may vary, but the fact is, is that cloud is obviously taking over. And I don't think there's anything that is inherent in cloud um, that makes us you know, pause at this particular moment in time except that it is forcing us to reevaluate so many of the habits, standards, and processes, decisions that we've historically made, uh, because it does require a change in thinking. It does require a change in paradigm for how we build applications and networks, how we deploy infrastructure, how we manage those systems, who we trust as, as third parties. Um, you know, in my mind, the cloud um, there is some element of truth when you say that the cloud is, is just somebody else's computer, right? One of the fundamental value propositions of the cloud uh, is that it's managed by a third party. It's, it's outsourced. It's now got shared responsibility for security, for availability, for all those things that, that used to fall squarely in an internal team's responsibility bucket. Um, that's far from the only value of the cloud. Uh, I don't like that joke much um, that I don't think it holds up uh, under analysis, but it's, uh, it's, it's not completely wrong either. So um, the three areas that we'll talk a lot about in the remainder of this presentation are gonna be the impacts to connectivity uh, on a cloud modernization strategy, the impact to some of the workflows uh, and the impact to the security questions and, and how we handle all of those individually. So the first um, impact on the connectivity side of this is that we really need to get out of thinking of uh, a branch office connectivity model. It has been the predominant paradigm for networks for many years in the enterprise space. We had data centers uh, all across the country. We had uh, branch offices from where our employees, our staff worked. Uh, and when we had new applications or we had new staff, we just built new connectivity, whether it was point-to-point -point VPNs or MPLS, that, that worked well. Um, that certainly was the model then that was adapted into these fintech and these financial services networks uh, composed of the very same pieces, the VPN, the MPLS, the dedicated circuitry um, that go into connecting to this new environment. And really at TrustGrid, as we've evolved our software-defined networking, as the market has adopted software-defined networking as a whole, it becomes more and more obvious that this is a very limited way to consider uh, networking and connectivity. Um, certainly, uh, that model has been challenged tremendously by COVID and by the work from home transition that many of our organizations have gone through and now look to be uh, more or less in a, in a semi-permanent, if not permanent configuration, right? Those changes are pervasive for a long time that we now need to be able to extend application access to a user, uh, also uh, to a system, uh, to a data set, uh, to the other application components, it's dependent on, independent of whether that's on our network or someone else's network, we need to ensure security for that. Uh, and as we're evaluating these networking and connectivity options, we really look at it, you know, from an application developer's perspective, it really is striking to me how many similarities there are from your developers and engineering teams that are evaluating their applications that need to go to the cloud 
with what the networking teams are going through today. Um, they certainly are focused on more of a multi-tenant type approach by and large, the ability to enable a single network with multiple different user types. I think that's inherent in the zero trust concept that Lance told us about earlier, that we're gonna have very different permission sets within this network for network level access for segments of the network uh, that have to that have to get along well with each other. They can't impact availability or performance. Um, but you know, we might have vendors on, on the same networks that we have partners for information exchanges for, for which we have customers, for which we have internal staff that are responsible for internal applications, for which we have support staff that are responsible for customer facing sites. Uh, and that certainly is is a very different paradigm from a security perspective and from a performance perspective than what we've historically done. Um, sort of that, that lateral movement, the, the, the perimeter based security um, that uh, Lance discussed earlier, uh, where once you were on the network, you might have had access to vast amounts uh, of resources for which you should not have been authorized, for which you should have had restrictions. And the, the legacy methods of control on that with access control lists or segments by VLANs or even more recently VERFs really were difficult for most enterprises to implement. Um, the, the telcos did a very good job of that, right? That's really what their bread and butter was. Um, but in many cases, the application providers, uh, especially in these fintech spaces, are operating as telco providers right now. They have very similar use cases to what the telcos did historically. Uh, at the same time, there's an inherent interest in moving away from those telcos um, due, to, due to the new cloud paradigm, due to the uh, interest in automation, due to the interest in outsourcing to competent providers, the ability to connect and secure those environments. Uh, the need for more automation goes hand in hand with that, right? We don't want to have installation times measured in months. Um, we don't want to have patching and updating that's done by teams of humans uh, in the wee hours of the morning with um, always some uh, crazy uh, unanticipated events occurring due to patching compatibility or configuration compatibility. Uh, we don't want to have to go make manual changes and, and really worry about a human being entering keys into a keyboard as being a weak point on the network. We want to do this with validation of those keystrokes, with retention of the audit logs of who did what centrally, with a centralized version control system, storing that configuration and then pushing that out. Um, you know, the deployments are becoming more complicated. You're, you're acting like a service provider as part of your network, as part of your offering of the application to internal users and external users. Uh, and that's adding a lot more um, to what those legacy networks were expected to do. Um, and then finally, the, the legacy network providers don't have a great track record in the cloud right now. The, um, without mentioning specific product names, uh, they really have been slow to adapt. They've been slow to deploy. They've been slow to support. That really is changing now, um, but it typically is changing with their newest software-defined offerings. They're not porting those legacy technologies and solutions into the cloud. Uh, they certainly have tried. I think that's a pretty dismal track record there, um, but their newest acquisitions, the newest releases of their software-defined products are just now in 2021 getting that uh, cloud-native um, integration from a networking perspective, uh, even if they're still many years away from being able to offer a true cloud native experience for their entire application set. You know, this is, um, feels like we're picking on uh, some of the legacy deployments that, that have served well, right, for now a couple of decades. Um, but we wanna make sure that that's not the case either because we believe that these environments are going to persist for, for quite some time. Um, you know, there was an era where these were the right solutions. And I think that the era that we're headed into right now is, is really a hybrid type approach where we're going to maintain uh, many aspects, many of these configurations and brands and, and models and appliances in their current form for, for several years as we move forward. Um, but we want to keep an eye on, on what's coming and looking at how these are going to operate in cooperation with each other, how we're going to rely on the traditional vendors for on-premise switching, a lot of those vendors have very robust wireless um, offerings that are going to be around for, for many, many years. That really is you know, a huge trend, uh, an increasing number of the access points deployed in replacement of some of those branch switches or um, um, local on-prem switch deployments. Um, but the future is coming. Uh, it really is here already. Uh, this uh, software-defined networking is certainly not a new technology, even though it is continuously evolving. And really what differentiates it from these legacy approaches 
Um, it's going to be how handles you know, what we have here on, on the screen here. And first and foremost is dynamic routing. Uh, the cloud really has embraced BGP as the method that they want to handle um, dynamic routing uh, at their level. And so the software defined folks have uh, all embraced that trust grid included um, for an IBGP approach. Um, but we also now are able to offer substantial enhancements over that. And, and really that comes from being able to control both sides of a connection where you have uh, a cloud-based appliance deployed in that environment um, that is um, monitoring that network from some centralized control plane and automatically changing that routing table as conditions change, whether that's you know from an IPSLA approach, just access latency or packet loss or errors on a connection up to complete outages. And um, that's certainly something that we see deployed widely now as we're relying more and more on the public internet and on connections that perhaps might not be quite as stable as dedicated tunneling but with an ultimate result that gets us uh, at least as good a level of reliability um, by offering some, some enhancements on what we've typically referred to as dynamic routing. Uh, finally, one touch deployments, right? A cloud-based approach to configuration with the validations we mentioned, uh, with the UI that enables folks that are not necessarily uh, network engineers to be able to make some of these configurations or to change configurations. Um, to have a version control system in place, but we're pushing out a, 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 a profile of some sort, what we refer to it at Trust Grid as, um, that has all the configuration, that if it fails on the deployment, it has a fail back model. These things can be managed, updated, and then also has an API, uh, which leads us into the next piece here on the automation side, um, to handle bulk changes, configuration changes. Um, I would say credential rotation is you know, one great example of what can be done via automation there at Trust Grid. We don't rely on pre-shared keys. We're all certificate based, but there's still a rotation of those keys that have to happen sooner or later and, and is a fully automated approach. Um, disaster recovery you know, certainly falls in that um, with the dynamic routing side. The ability to automate all patching um, really is, you know, I think, a, a huge win now for those environments, you've had various third-party tools or even tools provided by the major networking providers in the past um, that were able to solve some of those challenges with limited uh, efficacy. Um, and right now what we're seeing is the ability to patch thousands or even more devices in a single maintenance window fully automatically um, with a very, very high success rate and where success is not possible for one reason or another, uh, the ability to automate even those edge cases. Um, you know, software-defined solutions are continuously improving. We're no longer writing code to, to chips, packaging them in appliances, shipping them out. Uh, in fact, there is very, um, very few dependencies between the hardware that the, device is that the device is running and the software running on top of it. At Trust Grid, we support x86. Um, we have uh, in development right now support for ARM architectures as well. And then we're really agnostic to how that works. And we're able then to dramatically improve on the innovation side of the business by continuously improving that source code, new features, bug fixes, software defect resolutions, and so on. Uh, highly scalable, highly flexible, just the very nature of software itself and moving away from that chip-based architecture that we're able to, to offer new enhancements um, to be able to support additional performance improvements, et cetera, um, really in real time across the entire network. And finally, from a business approach to this, to the, the conversion, much like with the cloud that we're seeing where the OPEX uh, is far surpassing the, the capital expense and, and you get some of that scalability and flexibility we talked about to turn up or down the services that you need uh, in direct correlation with the expense allocated for the project. So the other big enhancement that we haven't yet talked about is, is the security side. Um, and I think this, this is really where software defined networks are able to go far in excess of what was done historically with these legacy FinTech approaches. Um, we have uh, all the features of that legacy approach, right? The encryption algorithms, the authentication systems, we uh, can do a lot of these things uh, easily. Um, whereas legacy approaches might have had or difficulty in implementing these requiring third-party tools or other products or services in that same vendor delivering your networking solution. And in the software-defined approach now, these are native feature sets in the product, which allows us to go well beyond some of the basic tactical security approaches uh, into more strategic level thinking, uh, like Zero Trust, which certainly is a combination of uh, the authentication um, mechanisms, right? The certificates that we're issuing, um, the traffic analysis, the ongoing authorization and authentication processes 
following successful initial connection. Um, the integrated threat detection, and we'll talk about this here in, in more detail, but with, with software, we're no longer isolated into these appliance-based models that say, uh, this appliance is dedicated for this particular purpose, and this one over here, the different colored appliance is gonna be for another purpose. We're able to start integrating the network and security approaches here very, very well. Um, and go beyond just the integrated uh, threat detection and into automated threat response because the same software that's controlling uh, the connectivity is performing the, the security aspects as well. Um, and then finally, the central visibility and monitoring. Once again, you know, so much that relied on third-party tools and a legacy fintech networking approach is now integrated into the solution, whether from TrustGrid or from other software-defined providers. Um, you know, we spend far less time on the operating system coding that the legacy approaches required hundreds of developers to be responsible for the customized operating system uh, avenues. What you find in the software defined worlds is uh, an embrace of open source networking, um, highly secure, highly scalable open source tool sets managed by, you know, well-known pr uh, projects with tons of visibility through it. And that allows us to both avoid spending time duplicating efforts where um, other solutions have had to do that uh, in the historical world, um, but also then to really embrace new new features and new feature sets by the, the same approach where we're not having to reinvent the wheel constantly to maintain feature parity with these um, third party tools that, that now are moving more and more so into the open source world. Right on cue as we're talking about the network and security merging and this is not just a trend, I think, with software defined um, networking. This is more of a global trend um, in the cloud, the public cloud environments, especially in, in now these edge computing environments as well, where TrustGrid certainly has a, a stake. Um, but at the fundamental level, really, it is the abstraction of the networking and the security away from any hardware based dependency or even away from a geographical location where we, we don't care where that. Uh, service is running. We don't care where um, the appliance is installed. We don't care where the subscription was made. Um, what we're doing is, is we're able to take those fundamental networking components in the software defined world, the software defined security world, which you know, just because of its later maturity, um, much more comfortable in that space, far more security tools were built native to that model out of the gate. Um, perhaps with the exception of, uh, exception of next gen firewalls that go back that far. Um, but really, it's the integration of these two services, uh, what Gartner has termed a SASE approach, S-A-S-E, a Secure Access Service Edge is probably the best example in the market today. Um, and certainly a trend now embraced by all of the major networking and many of the security providers as well. So all those um, big iron networking vendors have been around for decades, all have now um, made very large investments, both internally uh, in development and externally in acquisition into achieving this vision here. So, um, you know, really what we're looking at the future of networking being more of a security type approach. And, and really what we're seeing out in the market today is, you know, a lot of that budget that would have previously been called infrastructure or previously been dedicated to security or cloud modernization, um, efficiency improvements, right? Looking for ROIs really is shifting over to a risk management based approach and looking at hey i cannot i cannot get the efficiency improvement justified on its own it has to also then include the security and, and so the market's responding to that um and really where we're where we're taking this both within trust grid and i think as an, a, a, in a market as well um is you know keeping it in the software level being able to aggregate tremendous amounts of, of both infrastructure as well as data about that infrastructure's performance into very sophisticated control plane architectures. Uh, TrustGrid now, we're counting just tens of billions of net flows that we've been able to archive, metadata only, uh, for the fintech space um, just to identify application-specific traffic, traffic uh, unique to the space even custom applications in our customers' environments, to be able to tell potential threats from that, as well as to be able to identify uh, application performance issues and application outages. Uh, some very simple, some very complex, based on some more advanced machine learning models. Um, but we're only able to do that because of the existence of the software at the edge, the software-based approach. 
and the software at the control plane side, the centralized multi-tenant infrastructure um, that really extends our capabilities far beyond uh, what it would be if we were running exclusively on, on code deployed at the edge. And this is really our, our concept here, our, our nomenclature, the SD-WAN 2.0 approach. Um, you know, SD-WAN has obviously been around now more than a decade really was pitched as strictly an MPLS replacement for branch offices. Uh, and, and now we're starting to see that next evolution and Trust Grid finds ourselves right at the forefront of that evolution, um, where we're starting to see more of an application provider, a service provider mentality take over. I don't think anybody would doubt the, uh, the fact that branch offices are diminishing in their importance post COVID. They'll always exist. There will always be retail locations and, and those sort of environments. Um, we're not going to forget about them, but we're going to incorporate what we learned in SD-WAN 1.0 into a next iteration of this. And, and we'll let the, the smart folks over at Gartner or Forrester come up with the, the name. We understand they're working on this actively. Um, but what does it really mean, this next evolution? And, and within the trust grid world, within our customers and the financial services industries and the healthcare industries, what it really means is, is a lot more interconnectivity between organizations. Um, we want to be able to support those unique needs configurations um, when you have you know, multiple organizations involved in a single network, whether we're integrating on-premise data uh, into cloud-based applications, whether we're exchanging data um, between organizations securely with API, without APIs. Um, and the cloud native approach, I think, is, is really the critical aspect to it. There's, there's still a lot in the SD-WAN world that I would say is is a lot closer to the models of legacy networking providers um, than it is the, the SD-WAN 2.0 world and the cloud native aspects, right? The ability to generate really a cloud-like experience for customers where they're not focused on the hardware experience. They're not focused on the on-premise deployment, right? It's, it's a fully automated, fully managed experience where they're able to focus on strategic innovation, strategic value delivery to their internal and external stakeholders. Uh, as opposed to managing configurations of dozens of devices or god forbid trying to connect uh, customer managed devices with provider managed devices or partner devices with different firmware builds and manufacturers and models and, and all the the complexity that that's added to this problem historically so when we dig down deeper into the zero trust cloud networking approach here and you know here we're combining in that really the, the security side the zero trust piece with that networking side um, we're bringing with us some familiar concepts um, you know zero trust at its most basic level uh, is an implicit denial command right and that's nothing new or innovative but it's also so much more um, how often have you seen that approach last the test of time last troubleshooting persist across multiple hands in a configuration. So often in my career, it's been that that is the initial approach, but then that degrades very quickly when problems occur, or when other staff members get their hands on it, because it does add a ton of complexity. Um, within a true zero trust cloud networking approach, that, that is going to be impossible um, because those, those configurations are validated in real time, right? Because we have a policy engine that specifies what can and cannot be configured on this network, and there's there's no easy shortcuts around that. Um, that said, by eliminating most of the, the um, menial troubleshooting, um, deployment and configuration hassles, now there's far more time to focus on doing it the right way and getting it right, not just from day one, but on day 100 as well. Um, this approach you know, is gonna be user-centric in many cases or service-centric. So the identity provider integration is critical. TrustGrid offers that across all the major providers uh, with the open ID uh, compatibility. And we really wanna know what's occurring in the network and we wanna know more than just a source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. Where, where is the source right? geographically? What type of traffic are we seeing? What type of certificates are on there? There's so much that can be analyzed at the metadata level alone um, that extend the zero trust concepts far beyond right, a, a, a pre-shared key or far beyond a password for a user to access this. And then um, don't forget that you have to be continuously monitoring that this uh, authentication authorization is not a one step process. Uh, as the data changes about that connection, so too will the decisions 
that are being made to allow that access over time. There's some interesting work coming out of Google and some other folks calling this CAEP, C-A-E-P today. Um, but we're incorporating those concepts and have been for quite some time into the zero trust model. Lance covered some of the, the benefits of this approach, obviously. It does take traffic into far more of a north-south um, uh, uh, arch architecture. Uh, we do support, and many software providers do, a mesh type approach there. Um, but it's going to have such controls in place on a session by session basis, a tunnel by tunnel basis, that it really is tough to, to be able to execute lateral movement across any of these infrastructures. You still could possibly have reaches in this. That's always going to be a possibility. But when they do, they're much smaller, they're faster. Uh, on the detection side and then there's tooling designed to really help you troubleshoot identify the sources and then rapidly uh, disable or shut down the connectivity that is suspicious this global visibility and control i think the one pane of glass has been a promise for many many years i'm sure we've all uh, bought products with that promise and then promptly integrated third parties into it to get the data that we really wanted here and you know, Trust Grid's approach, like most software-defined networking providers, is, is really to focus on what we are good at, to focus on the aspects of this that we can deliver at a very high level, and then integrate and partner with those folks um, that are doing the, the, the real work around interfacing to users to show the infrastructure globally. Um, at the same time, being able to provide a level of tooling within the user interface and the API such that those very powerful integration between those tools um, and that we're able then when we do have a potential threat identified or just your run-of-the-mill outage uh, we're able to quickly identify what what that is without having to bring in um, you know the two o'clock in the morning on-call staff for very difficult problems this becomes more of a network operations center uh, problem more than the security operations center unless those guys are needed right really starting to, to drive down uh, the escalations of these situations. Um, a lot of the same benefits here, um, but you know, really what it comes down to, I, I think, is we're going to be able to give the network operations teams, um, the, the security operations teams, those tier one guys on those teams, a level of access and control that previously has been restricted got to some very advanced skill sets and some very expensive internal resources that are very, very busy and don't like getting woken up at two o'clock in the morning for the most part. And this piece we touched on earlier as well. Um, you know, once we have the software, once we have the centralization of the control plane, once we have data feeds at the metadata level only, um, which is where Trust Grid really specializes in this, uh, all that data plane um, and all the payload data we, we specifically exclude from our models that you will find other vendors out there that are incorporating that data into theirs as well um, you know what you have is a data set that quite frankly has never existed in, in history uh, trust grid is seeing just billions and billions of transactions a month uh, in the um, financial services space across many different providers across many different integrations across many different use cases um, and the beautiful part about these fintech and financial services networks is they're highly deterministic they are this is not a tremendous amount of user traffic by and large this is system integration traffic data exchanges etc for which the the predictability uh, of, of it is very very high um, and, and small differences uh and what we've seen based on uh, compared to what we've seen previously are able to, to be identified and then reported at a very, very high level of consistency. This is not a ton of false positives. The world gets a lot messier in the, in the um, wet space when humans are involved and in, you know, network traffic is, is web applications and all sorts of other stuff. That certainly feeds into part of what we do, um, but really where we're seeing the most success with the AI and ML um, models is gonna be around this application integration stuff because the variation, the variability of that traffic is, is very minimal. The, the packet sizes, the transmission times, the latency, obviously even far beyond source and destinations in here. Um, we're able to fingerprint those applications and that known good traffic in a very specific way uh, and then apply those patterns um, across the network very easily, right? And as soon as malicious traffic is detected, we're not waiting for the next update or patch to have that um, that, that piece now synchronized across the network. It's happening in that control plane in real time. It's learning uh, and applying those new rules really minute by minute.
you know, great stat here. Um, and Gartner's using this term zero trust networks. I would argue that today, anybody calling themselves a zero trust network, the overlap between that and software defined networking is very high. The, the zero trust is almost impossible to get right with legacy network infrastructure. Some have done it, kudos to, to them. It's a lot of work, a lot of tooling. Um, but really today, what you're seeing here is, is not that there's anything wrong necessarily with the virtual private network in and of itself. It's just the, the benefits to moving from a security perspective, especially also an efficiency perspective, but we're leading with that security today because that is what enterprises are looking for. Um, it's huge, right? And those VPNs really have been untouched with a site to site or whatever approach you're taking there for, for many years. IPsec has been around a long, long time. Um, so where our customers are really engaging with us and reporting uh, the benefits the deployment speed, right? Being able to scale that organization out much faster, especially as it relates to third-party connectivity, multi-cloud connectivity is a big one these days. Um, especially as skill sets might not, you know, uh, transfer. We now have some very solid folks that know a lot about cloud and not much about on-prem environments, and vice versa, or know a lot about one cloud environment but not necessarily the others that have similar concepts but take take some time to get used to. Um, you know, this transition to infrastructure as code, being automated, being able to control it with, with some basic Python skills or whatever the language of choice you have is. And TrustGrid really embraces that uh, in our portal. Uh, our rule is first the API and then the portal interface because many of our customers truthfully don't log into the portal. Um, they're extracting the data they want from the portal, putting it in their own dashboards. Uh, and then they're also managing it through their own tool sets um, and automating a lot of what happens there in terms of threat response or incident response. The compliance piece can't, can't get away with a financial services presentation without touching on that. It's a big deal um, being able to stay patched, to stay updated, to prevent zero days, uh, to look at um, what compliance is asking for today, but also to anticipate what's coming down the pipe. It's not that difficult. Most of those standards are going to be based in the same root standards um, and being able just to evolve the solution. And that really is what it comes down to, right, is that software defined capabilities allow us faster evolution, which means keeping up with the rapidly changing world of, of security and compliance. Now, the easier support you know, to show you what we're doing now at TrustGrid and if you've seen it with other software defined providers in terms of automating the support process, identifying potential issues, not requiring the length of troubleshooting time or the advanced skill sets because it's in a portal, because it's validated, you can't hit the wrong key, because it's audited, because there's a button to click instead of a command line to enter with numerous switches, right? We're just simplifying that whole process and really pushing it downhill away from those folks that have strategic level uh, operational responsibilities and into the tactical level of those knocks. Um, and then the business imperative, right, to, to get out of a lot of the CapEx, to focus that CapEx on strategic investment. And really, it's hard to say that these networks um, have maintained a lot of strategic value. Uh, for many of our customers, when they rolled these networks out initially, it was a game changer in the market, right? They had tremendous strategic advantage over their competitors who did not have these networks in place. Um, by and large, the market has caught up to them, and now they're looking at substantial costs, CapEx, but also OpEx, uh, distraction from where that new strategic value is coming from. They're, they're spending a lot of cycles on these uh, legacy technologies, and they're looking for a way to get past that, and that's something that we offer as well as many others in the market. So just really talking about some of these specific applications here, right? And, and some of the issues that uh, Lance brought up, some of the good examples, you know, it really comes down to the zero trust model. It comes down to the software defined nature of our solution um, that just gives us an advantage over really anything else. The fact that we're not relying on a variety of third party tools in our customer environments that are going to be, um, you know, require specific training or require skill sets there. Um, the whole infrastructure, and really we use that P word, that platform word to describe this more and more, as the software's complexity has increased, it's moved far beyond a connectivity solution, even far beyond a container deployment and management solution, which initially was a tool that we developed for our own use, right, to move code in and out of environments quickly for specific use cases like what you're seeing here, um, and now integrating with our application providers into their own applications. But um, I think we beat up a lot of these in the previous slides. Let's keep moving. So just to, here to wrap things up, 
um, you know, Trust Grid is born uh, in the financial services space. Um, we have, were developed in collaboration with some of the largest names out there. Um, and we feel like we're the only ones that are really designed to support these needs for financial institutions, financial service providers, and anyone that's moving you know, tremendous amounts of, um, of, of financial transactions. Um, about 1,200 installs specifically in this space in the U.S. today, um, that largest database of multi-vendor financial transactions that are driving a lot of our ML work today. Um, definitely an eye towards FFIEC and OCC, partly with the, our SOC 2 Type 2 compliance initiatives here, but at a broader level, it's to simplify the compliance audits of our customers and their customers as well. Uh, and then you know, today, pushing about $4 trillion of payments of all sorts from you know, ACH and SWIFT transactions up to mortgage payments, bill pays, and all sorts of things in between, peer-to-peer, -peer, et cetera. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Um, that wraps it up for us. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in through the q and I guess we'll go ahead and address those now. Um, the, the first question was, does TrustGrid only support TCP transactions in the tunnels? That's a common question because I think for a lot of the um, a lot of the providers are relying on either an IPsec approach for layer three tunneling. That's been done for a long time. A lot of flexibility there. TrustGrid really has taken a different approach. Um, number one, um, we do uh, emphasize our inside out architecture for these networks, especially as it relates to third party connectivity. We don't want to be allowing traffic inside um, or through a, a firewall. Um, forwarding of ports and those things, opening holes, very often. You have to do that once in a while. It's best to do that centrally. And then those tunnels that we're supporting that are being built for those firewalls are going to take two flavors. The, the TLS approach, which is becoming more and more common, and I suspect what, what the, uh, the questioner is asking about. We also support a UDP approach with a few different standards there. One is the wire guard standard, which is becoming pretty popular. Um, and then our own UDP tunneling approach. Um, much better performance, right? much faster transactions, uh, a lot of flexibility in how you're handling that. TLS works great in many cases, but when it doesn't, UDP-based is, is the way to go. And so perhaps there's some um, experience that that uh, attendee has with that system. But yeah, we, we support both. Um, and those are evolving rapidly as well. Those UDP tunnels um, just a year ago where I would say uh, infrequently used, um, but a ton of use cases have erupted here. Um, with the massive cloud modernization push that we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months. Okay. Uh, last question is, how does TrustGrid connect to existing networks? Does TrustGrid have to be on both sides? Um, the good one. So, you know, TrustGrid does support standards like IPsec, does support GRE, though we, we beat them up a little bit and they certainly have their weaknesses. Um, it does limit some of the feature sets that we can um, can offer when we are integrating to existing devices. But I think asking for a full rip and replace to uh, to get a uh, new technology, whether it's anything, is, is a, a tall ask. So most of our customers are starting out um, with limited deployments, obviously, proof of concepts, pilots, with deep integration into their existing systems and tools um, before they're willing to uh, to really you know pull the plug, walk away from the old way of doing things and into the modern way. And I think a way that really looks a lot like what you know Amazon is doing or, or Azure, right? You can you can just lift and shift an application up there. Um, you can you can have the benefit of it running in that environment, but you're really not leveraging the strategic value those environments provide until there is some um, commitment to the platform, the the incorporation of their specific tools and, and features uh, into the application. TrustGrid's a bit less uh, focused on application customization, though there is SDK and API possibilities for those. Um, really, it's about getting both ends of that connection ultimately to deliver the, the best user experience, the best experience of those applications, the highest degree of security, because we do control both, both endpoints. We do see um, you know, the data plane those endpoints we're referring to. Uh, gives us a lot of data, a lot of um, a unique perspective from support and security. Um, but also from the control plane, um, really where we are doing a lot of out of band work these days, because there's just two separate sets of tools that are in use um, to give us, I think, a, a unique approach to how we do this. That concludes our webinar. 
If you'd like to request a demo, you can go to TrustGrid.io and click the button on the top right to request that. Thank you for attending.